Hi, everybody. Welcome to our Google Hangout today from Sigma Xi, the Scientific Research Society. My name is Heather Thorstensen, and I'm the manager of communications for Sigma Xi. My guest today is Miles O'Brien. He's a journalist who reports on science, technology, and aerospace. He works with PBS NewsHour and Frontline, as well as the PBS science documentary series Nova, the National Science Foundation Science Nation series, and he is an aviation analyst for CNN. He is based in Washington, D.C., but he's joining us today from Boston. And Sigma Xi is going to be giving Miles the honorary membership into the society this year. He will formally become a member of Sigma Xi during the annual meeting, and that's going to be in October, October 22nd through 25th in Kansas City, Missouri. Honorary membership is a lifelong honor, so we're proud to have Miles O'Brien join the society. Before we get started, I have some housekeeping things. The main thing is that we want to make sure that this is interactive and that we take your questions. So you have the ability to ask questions on the right side of the screen. You should see a green button in the lower right corner that says, ask a new question. And if you can ask those anytime, and I will take those and relay those to Miles. So Miles, thank you for joining today. It's a pleasure, Heather. Thank you. Let's get started by talking a little bit about your background. You are a science journalist, but that's not always what your career path was going to be, I'm assuming, because you're a history major in college. So how did you go from that to your current career? Uh, it's purely accidental. I was, uh, as you say, a history major in college, and um, I was in the news business. I was fascinated by journalism and photography and filmmaking and pursued that for quite uh, a number of years, a dozen years, working <clears throat> primarily at local TV stations and uh, covering local TV fare. And uh, I was in uh, actually working in Boston at the time. Uh, this is 1992 when I heard that CNN was looking for a science correspondent. And uh, I actually interestingly heard it from a colleague of mine who uh, knew about it and she was in the next cubicle over. And she kind of hung up the phone and said, uh, do you know anything about science? And I said, no, I don't really. Why do you ask? She said, well, CNN is looking for a science correspondent. And um, I said, well, I don't know much about science, but I'd like to work for CNN maybe. So I managed to cobble together a tape that had some reasonably techie kind of stories. I managed to get an interview, which turned out to be a two-day ordeal in Atlanta. Uh, with the uh, science editor at the time at CNN, Bailey Barish, who is a former molecular biologist who actually knows a lot about science, and she gave me a written and oral exam, among other things, and I flunked it terribly. They asked me things about climate change in 1992, and I really didn't know what that was. So um, I uh, got to the end of this long um, thing, and I had done, you know, I'd read on camera and done the other predictable things, but it flunked the science. And so I got to the president of uh, CNN at the time, Bob Fernand, and he said, well, you know, clearly you don't know Jack about science. And uh, I said, uh, that's why you need to hire me. And uh, I was kind of throwing a Hail Mary pass at the time, but actually there was some truth in that that I didn't appreciate at the time, uh, that not having a scientific background has some advantages. Uh, and just as long as you're uh, respectful of the subject matter and respectful of the subjects and not afraid of the subject matter, which is a big problem for a lot of humanities people like me. So I ended up getting this amazing scientific education through the eyes of Nobel laureates and the like covering science for CNN for many years. And uh, it's been a, um, you know, it's interesting because I find the subject matter fascinating. And I wonder if I had been taught a little better along the way, if I would have pursued science as a career. But in the end, I think uh, the, the role I play is, um, is a good one. I enjoy being kind of in that space in between the, the humanities lovers and the, the, uh, the scientists and trying to be uh, the interpreter. So as someone who jumped into this science industry as a journalist and you've learned as you went, what have you come to appreciate about science that you didn't have an appreciation for before? Well, I, I think um, I, I didn't fully understand um, 
I didn't know much about how science worked, and I didn't really understand how the peer review process works and uh, the the rigor that scientists go through before they even publish anything. And um, I think a lot of people in the general public who don't appreciate the scientific process don't understand, you know, what what is behind a scientific paper versus an article written in a magazine. It's it's two standards. It's a it's a different thing, and so um, I, I, I learned to appreciate um, uh, the value of, of what scientists say in a different way. Uh, and um, you know, as time went on and science got balled up in politics, particularly, and I'm thinking about climate change mostly. Uh, it was good to um, be. I, I tried to constantly be a voice in the in the newsroom. Uh, trying to make people who don't appreciate it understand that, you know, when you get an IPCC pronouncement, there's a lot of science and rigor and peer review underneath it uh, versus a, you know, a PR type of message from the Cato Institute or something. They're not equivalent. And so I, I tried to make it um, my goal to explain that to uh, people who didn't fully appreciate it. So uh, I, I think that's one of the most important takeaways just generally about how science works. And that's interesting that you bring up that point about how some people might not appreciate all the scientific rigor that goes into these findings because Sigma Xi has a blog. We just had a big blog series about what people call the war on science or how some people aren't trusting what scientists are saying, the, the general consensus in the scientific community. So what is it that, how is it that you are able to get that across to help people understand all of the different details and all of the work that goes into it. It's not easy, uh, and because there's a you know a fundamental uh, scientific um, uh, literacy problem in this country, um, I think that, um, and there's some deep-seated societal issues um, that go along with this, and and frankly, the, uh, the 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 popular general mainstream media doesn't really cover science science in a very uh, insightful and, or nuanced way. Uh, and part of the problem is it's difficult to do uh, in the time constraints of, you know, being a CNN. I was a CNN correspondent for 17 years, and most of my stories would be on the order of two and a half minutes, maybe, maybe three minutes sometimes, uh, if that. And trying to do justice to all those little nuances and explaining things in that time uh, crush is is very very difficult and if if the audience doesn't have a basic understanding of you know the value of a scientific pronouncement versus um, you know a PR pronouncement it is um, it's up to us as journalists to try to explain that but it's difficult and so I, I remember doing a, um, a documentary for CNN in the uh, late uh, 1990s about climate change and um, it was uh, I, I wanted to try to avoid doing uh, any interviews at all with some of the classic um, skeptics who I felt were you know didn't have a scientific underpinning and or at the very least not make it you know on the one hand on the other hand stuff uh, with it with it, this kind of false equivalency which we're, we're uh, we were putting out there you know journalists think well because they're they cover a lot of politics is you go out and interview a person on one side then you get a person on the other side and you end up with a balanced story but it's just the opposite in this case if you go out and uh, you interview um, somebody who's representing real science versus somebody who's bought and paid for by the uh, fossil fuel industry to put them on as equivalent uh, players is is um, in fact uh, inaccurate so it was really a uh, I'm sorry I'm I, this is not your uh, question. I apologize. I've kind of gone off on a tangent, but it's really not. Uh, it was hard for me to um, convince uh, and make people who are a bunch of, uh, frankly, in the newsroom, there are a lot of science phobics, uh, convince them that it isn't accurate to do this kind of 50-50 type of coverage. That's interesting. And for scientists who may want to be getting more of their work out into the public and may want to be working with more members of the media like you, do you have any advice for them? Well, I think um, 
it's it's not easy uh, because uh, I mean, after all, I worked at CNN and we had an eight person science unit, which was uh, we were all fired on one day in December of 2008. Uh, and if a place like CNN feels like uh, having people there who know a little bit about science and I'm not saying I was the one, I was the history major, but there were people actually on staff who really did know science and I, I learned along the way. Uh, if if the, they're not, there's nobody to pick up the phone at the other end anymore who really understands um, science in, or takes the time to learn it, uh, frankly, which is a terrible statement. So how do you, how do you uh, tell your story? There, there's a lot of other ways to tell stories besides getting on CNN and Fox or CBS Evening News, um, there's uh, every, you know, in this day and age, we all have the ability to tell our own stories somehow, some way. So uh, I would encourage, um, you know, there are some scientists who frankly have no interest, desire, or inclination for this. And I don't think they should be mandated to do that because that they should do science. But there are some who are able to kind of fire off of both sides of their brain and can, uh, do science, but also have the ability to, you know, tell a story too. And I feel uh, it's almost, uh, well, you know, this sounds a little high horse, but uh, it's their obligation, frankly, to try to tell that story as best they can. And they can start by, you know, blogging and tweeting and sharing as much as possible and, and you know, developing relationships with the, the few uh, reporters who are out there covering um, science. Uh, as a specialty, we still exist, but we're you know we're a diminishing group, and uh, and remember that 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 science um, science coverage for the for the um, a mass audience, the 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 things that you think are important maybe are not as important for that narrative and it, it's kind of the opposite of what you think is important sometimes. Scientists focus on specific findings, things, developments, whatever. Uh, and a lot of times what's most interesting to people is, um, is the hunt itself, is the process, and the, and the person driving that hunt, what motivates them. Basically, that's a long way of saying a really good story is driven by people, by characters. And so, uh, and that's, it's not, um, it, it is definitely not something that the typical scientist um, is taught to do uh, and is comfortable doing, but they sort of have to be out there as as a person and telling their story as well as the story of whatever they're pursuing scientifically. And so that that requires a little change of thinking, I think, for scientists. And a lot of them would say, well, you know, I don't want to bother doing that. I'd rather do my science. But ultimately, the more that we can bridge this gap and try to um, get people and the general public to respect science a little bit more, uh, the better off that'll be. And, and that ultimately will mean that, you know, NIH budgets won't be as under siege as they are in Congress. And maybe we won't have, you know, chairman of science committees in Congress who, um, you know, don't believe in evolution. So uh, there's, there's uh, ultimately, uh, there is, I think, a responsibility of scientists if they want to continue getting funded as they have in the past to try to explain their, their, what they're doing in a broader context and, and tell it in a way that makes people, that engages people, which means telling stories in a very human way. And I wonder for someone like you who might be getting requests from scientists or maybe you're looking for somebody to interview for a story and you're looking for a scientist, would, does it help you when you see somebody who's already blogging and using social media Absolutely. and you're thinking that's a more credible source? Well, it's just, you know, it, it helps me understand the people who, um, you know, are interested in doing that. It helps me stay abreast of, uh, of science communicators, if you will. And I think it's even more important for um, news entities that don't follow it as closely as I do. I mean, I, I read, you know, I read the journals and I'm more dialed into this in general, uh, but there are a lot of reporters who are not as um, engaged. And so, yes, to be out there, to be telling your own story is really important if you can and, and uh, you know, if you want to. Uh, and it's, I think more scientists should because the more we can get away from 
the you know kind of the Hollywood depiction of what science is or the um, the way it has been characterized in the political realm uh, around the issue of climate uh, science in particular the way that to, to push beyond that requires a little bit of effort and so say a scientist does take that next step where they're putting themselves out there online through social media through a blog or I know a lot of our Sigma Xi members go out in public to schools or they do science talks what advice can you give them about how to be engaging you mentioned telling stories using people how would that apply to their research if they don't see a, a direct connection well yes some research is is you know at the most fundamental levels it's you know it's difficult to uh, understand what the what the, the 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 ultimate application might be but you know it's kind of important to remind people of the you know the bell labs example that there are there are um you you put or or i did a story recently on uh Janelia farm in uh, the hhmi um endeavor where the the serendipity of science is is really important it's important to, to um, fund stuff which doesn't necessarily have an application in the next widget you know the the uh, we all we all love our our iPhones but there's there's a lot of fundamental science that made this thing possible it's important to remind people that you wouldn't have this gadget if you didn't have a lot of research that began with just a scientist asking a very broad question that he wasn't thinking about the iPhone at the time. So um, I think if you, if you remind people of that, the value of that, and then remind them of how, take them through what it's like to be on that hunt, that, that exploration, people, people like a journey and, and they, they love the idea of, you know, the unknown. So even if it's something that doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna get, you know, a Teflon coated pan, uh, it is um, interesting to pursue the unknown, and if you put it in the context of how previous pursuits like that, which seemed uh, like they were just sort of indulgent, led to actually very useful things, and then if we don't keep indulging in those passions, we're going to run out of new ideas for useful things. So um, I think that's that ultimately if you if you take the time to explain people that explain that to people they uh, they get it um, but it's you know it's it's hard when um, you know it's it you know remember back to, well this would have been before your time Heather but you know the the golden fleece days of William uh, Proxmire you know when they it's easy to pick out individual studies with funny titles and and say uh, and scoff at them and say that they are you know a waste of taxpayer money, but in, in the long run, uh, it, you know that's it's, it may, might be entertaining, but it it uh, is important to uh, know that sometimes things that seem a little bit um, it, um, indulgent uh, lead to really interesting conclusions and findings. And what about how you a scientist should be speaking to their audience? Some people are very good about not using jargony words, but how do you know how much the public understands and what kind of level you should start with when you're talking about certain topics? Well, you have to you know, explain it to the history majors of the world, like me, uh, as best you can. Um, you know, I, listen, everybody, uh, most scientists go to, um, you know, the occasional cocktail party or uh, talk to their neighbors. And, you know, how do you, how do you explain it or how do they explain it to their, their mother, I, assuming she's not a Nobel laureate. Um, the, uh, you know, try, I always try to think about when I'm doing my stories, you know, explaining it to my, my um, kids or my mother, that kind of thing. Um, I, I think if you keep that in mind and be, you know, respectful that people want to go with you along the ride. And um, in the case of when you're dealing with a, a member of the media like me, I think it's important to, um, uh, you know, I, I've run into many scientists along the way who have, I think, have the sense of uh, they're afraid to use um, more simple terms and analogies because they, number one, might get it wrong, but number two, might look stupid to their peers. And sometimes you got to take a little risk on that um, and, and hope you can find that middle ground between 
simplifying things, making it engaging, and dumbing it down, because we don't want to dumb it down, but we do want to make it, uh, we, we need to find ways to explain it, uh, and it can be very complex at times, but we need, we need to find ways to explain it that uh, make it, um, uh, you know, understandable and relevant. And what do you think about the balance that should be out there in terms of video and text? I noticed in the video that we had for your trailer for this Google Hangout, it was all <coughs> video and shot in such a way that you were barely seen in it at all. You were only in it for a little bit, and the rest of the time it was like we were seeing it through your eyes. Mm -hmm. Is that a style that you would recommend? Well, um, as a reporter, that's a style I like. I like to, as much as possible, let the uh, scientists themselves tell their story. Uh, but I'm kind of an old-fashioned guy, you know. A lot of uh, a lot of reporters like to be the, right in the middle of the story a little more. Uh, that's just not the way um, the PBS NewsHour likes it. Certainly, I'm doing a Nova film right now. I, I don't, you know, I narrate them, but I don't appear on camera do, doing them. So, um, but the scientists themselves—they're the talent. They need to. Um, they need to get out there and, and sell it somehow and uh, be engaging about it. Um, I don't, I forget which uh, story you put on there, but, um, you know, we, we had, um, when we went to West Africa, we met uh, a great um, scientist by the name of Lena Moses, who uh, does work on hemorrhagic diseases. And, you know, this is a classic case. Now, obviously, this has real rel relevancy to ultimately Ebola. And so, you know, there's, it's not, basic sense in the classic sense that it's really hard to understand why it matters but you know so it matters what she does but uh having said that what was really uh interesting about uh her was this idea almost kind of like this indiana jones component to her work where she was going into uh small villages and trapping uh, a, a breed of African rat that is carries the loss of fever virus and and that kind of that sense of uh uh, there, there was a story there and an adventure and and it was laid against of course something as dramatic as Ebola so it was kind of easy but she was very um, willing and able to uh, bring us along for the ride and and was um, you know suffered through my um, stupid questions that that brought it down to a level that made it uh, accessible to everybody and it was worth it. So it does require a little bit of patience and you know, you might think the reporter is kind of stupid, uh, but you know, there's an old saying in, in our business that there's no stupid questions, only stupid answers. And it's just a matter of trying to meet the reporter uh, at least halfway from your world. And so, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're trying to write the blog post or tweet or if the reporters called you up, um, you know, try try to think of ways to to make that make that uh, bridge that gap somehow, and it, it it requires a little bit of creative thinking that you might not have learned, um, you know, when you're getting a PhD in chemistry. Okay, I want to remind everybody who's watching. I've seen some people just join uh, throughout the hangout. You might not have heard me say at the beginning that we're taking questions for Miles, and um, you could see that little green button on the bottom right of your screen that says "Ask a New Question." So you can just push that button, and I'll ask it. We do have a question. The question is: What's one of the biggest communication challenges you've experienced in regards to explaining a very technical subject to the general public? which we've talked about a little bit, but is there anything else you'd like to say about that? Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, there, there are a bunch of them. They, they come along uh, relatively frequently. And um, I think, um, you know, you just, I, you know, I, um, I, I, I guess this is kind of where I have an advantage being the history major, right? So I, I, if, if you're the guy who's the history major who, presumably um, thinks a little more like the average viewer. Um, and then I just have to um, do a lot of homework to get up to speed, uh, you know, attain a level of understanding, and then try to dial it back down into language and analogies that, um, that work. But there's, there's lots of stuff that comes along like that, that you know, that, um, you know, a lot of the, the, you know, going back to that Genelia Farm piece, or just thinking about that, you know, a lot of the work on uh, uh, Drosophila and, and understanding how the brain works uh, of, a, of a fruit fly and uh, all these things are, um, can be kind of esoteric, but, um, you know, you, um, 
it, you know, th there are ways to do it. It's just, and a lot of times, you know, uh, what I do, um, and you know, a lot of reporters are loath to do this, but I, um, I frequently, uh, after I've been with a scientist, I will spend, uh, I will send them portions of the script, and I kind of, I prefer kind of taking a peer review approach myself, and having them uh, go over uh, some of the facts, certainly the facts, but also helping me work through some of these explanations and analogies, trying to come up with ways that are, you know, true to the science and yet accessible. Okay. And you mentioned that you read scientific journals. Is there any other areas where you really like to look for science stories? Mm. You know, I get, I get all kinds of, you know, I get a lot of PR people sending me stuff, but I also, um, you know, AAAS is a good source. Uh, there's a lot of, um, there's various, you know, listservs that I'm on that kind of track papers and, and um, developments. And, you know, I just, uh, I'm just kind of always looking for stuff. And a lot of times, you know, I'm kind of at the intersection between uh, news and science. You know, it's, I, I'm do, I'm doing a Nova right now in Fukushima, uh, you know, and, and a lot of Novas are purely separate from the news environment, you know. Um, so the Novas I do are a little bit different. Uh, and so I am always looking for um, news, we call it a news peg. I'm looking for events that have captured the public's attention and I'm looking for a way to look at it from a scientific perspective one way or another. And, uh, you know, it, it's kind of the, the teachable moment scenario. You know, you want to when people are focused and listening and and uh, worried about a topic or watching a topic, you want to, I, I feel like that's the opportunity to, um, you know, give them a, a spoonful of science uh, because uh, they may not even know they got it. You know, they're, they're busy focused on something, you know, on the subject at hand. And so, um, so that's a lot of how I dictate my stories. I'm looking at what, what is, in the public realm, what's interesting, what's, what stories are kind of trending and what's, what's out there that people are paying attention to. And I'm looking for what we call sidebars, scientific sidebars. All right, we have another question. The question is, how do you think science communication is handled nowadays? How do media outlets handle it? What improvements can be made to better inform the public, if any? Well, I think uh, the, the short answer is media outlets don't handle it well at all. Uh, and um, I consider myself, you know, I have a lot of experience in the cable news world, and I don't think you have to watch cable news very long to realize that science is not treated with any sort of uh, priority or respect or dignity for that matter. So uh, I think that's generally the way it is, unfortunately. Uh, I, you know, th there's still a reasonably good um, science uh, department at the uh, New York Times, but basically newspapers have gotten rid of their science reporting capacity. Uh, so I, I don't want to be self-serving, but I find myself very fortunate to be working for PBS where they still care. Uh, the news hour um, is, um, is, has supported my endeavors now for four years, and I've been able to do some amazing stories at uh, at the length I'd never be able to do at CNN. And uh, so I think, um, how do we change that? Uh, it's, it's not easy because the, uh, the trend in um, local and cable and network news is just the opposite of what we're talking about. It's, um, it's very trivial. It's, um, you know, it's stuff that's, um, uh, you know, celebrity news and whatever the case may be. I, I, I don't have to explain what we're all seeing. It's, it's a lot of junk. And, uh, and unfortunately, that this becomes like a, a death spiral because people watch it and, you know, this, this dive to the bottom continues. So how do we change that? I mean, that's, that's a really big uh, question for society. I think we need to uh, teach science better. Not, uh, and I'm not talking about to scientists. We have the best science education of the world if you want to pursue it as a career. But what, I, what I'm talking about is um, teaching history majors a little more about science and how it works, at least in the broadest sense, and, and how important it is uh, would be useful. 
so that, you know, I, I remember this, you know, early on at CNN and I was, uh, we, back in the old days when we were still on tape, before we put a show, a piece on the air, we had to take it down to the supervisor and producer and pop it in a, you know, a player and play it for him before he would release it to go to air. And I remember one time early on playing this piece and, and the guy said, I uh, watched it. And I think it was on, I think it was on something like Bucky balls, uh, Bucky, when Bucky balls were kind of hot. And, uh, and he looked at me and he said, you know, I know that's science, but that was, that was actually interesting. And so I said, really, I just started laughing. I said, you know, science is interesting, you know? And he said, no, no, no. It's like, and so there's this whole kind of, you know, anti-science, you know, bias in the newsroom. There's a bunch of science phobics there. And so it's very difficult to kind of break through that. That's why, you know, circling back to what I was just saying, you, you, we need to, we don't, none of us who want to tell a story have to funnel ourselves through that, you know, that tiny little gate that is, you know, the, the old gatekeepers who are all the science phobics uh, are in some ways irrelevant these days. There's a lot of other ways to tell stories. And there are people like me out here still doing my thing. And, and hopefully, you know, the interesting thing is that these stories, whenever you poll people, uh, they're interested, they're fascinated by it. It's, it's just like anything, a, a story well told will uh, interest people. And so it's up to, you know, people like me to, to take the extra effort. And, and part of why it doesn't get done is it, it takes extra effort and money and, and time to understand these stories in a way and make them, um, make them uh, interesting to uh, a mass audience. And so that's a little bit of why, uh, you know, CNN has, and others have walked away from it. Okay, we have also sort of a follow-up question to that question, which is how about sm smaller local news networks? Should they only base research that impacts their local community? Should they just report research that has broad reach or a combination of both depending on the goal? Well, I, you know, I'm not an expert on local news anymore. Last time I worked in local news was 1992, but I, you know, and I frankly don't watch a lot of it. So um, I think anything, um, Local news is not a, um, a um, well, it historically doesn't spend a lot of time covering science in a, in a meaningful way. When I worked in local news, if I, I, you know, I frequently would have to do three stories a day. So, you know, you can imagine how that fits into the world of covering science. So having said that, I think that, you know, a lot of what science does is universal and affects people locally and globally local news has this construct where they want to find the, you know, you know, a plane crashes with 250 people on it. And the headline is one local person dies along with 249 others. You know, it's kind of that approach. And so that kind of limits, um, depending on where you are, you know, I'm here in Boston, there's a lot of science here, uh, but you know, maybe not so much in other places that kind of limits what you do. And, and I think it's a, it's a unfortunate construct in the world of local news, but I don't think, um, I, you know, typically there aren't going to be science specialist reporters in the world of local news. They're running around chasing fires and dead bodies and, and whatever, um, you know, the typical local news fair is. Okay. Our next question is during a public question and, and, and answer session, how do you deal with someone's inaccurate understanding of a subject based on what Dr. Google says, other than <laughs> being pre-armed with reputable websites or simply stating, consider the source? Well, there's nothing wrong saying, uh, you know, of course, everything you read on the uh, internet is true, right? You know, you get a little laugh on that. I mean, I, I think, you know, it's important when people, um, do, uh, you know, whatever they say in those contexts is important to be, you know, respectful of them for one thing. I mean, I, scientists have a, a, a um, with all due respect, they do have um, a, a, a reputation for, well, they are smart, but they, they have a reputation for being, you know, there, there's a certain concern about perpetuating a, a myth of arrogance, put it that way. So don't, don't ever look arrogant when you're doing that. You know, and just say, you know, that's an understandable thing. I know that's out there, but let me just tell you what the facts are in this. And and the truth is the internet is filled with lots of things that are wrong about science. And, 
you know, you might want to suggest in, if you're, you know, to them, if you would like to, um, you know, uh, learn about this particular subject, here's, here's one good place to go. And, and there you're going to find some unvarnished stuff or, or make sure you watch Miles O'Brien's stories. It's good. They're going to be accurate to a, to a fault or, or something like that. You know, so, um, it's, uh, you know, but it's important not to just, you know, say you, 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 what, what kind of an idiot are you? Don't you know any better? Because that, that would be the temptation sometimes. Okay, great. Thanks for asking those questions, everybody in the audience. We want to keep those questions coming. Just push that little green button that says ask a new question on the lower right part of your screen, and I'll keep asking Miles those questions, but those are it for now. So I wanted to know, Miles, what you think right now is on your radar. What are the big stories that you're seeing so far for this year, and what do you think is coming up that people will be really interested in? Well, uh, I sure hope they'll be interested in my Fukushima story, which I'm working on right now. I've been pretty got my uh, head down on that, and uh, we've got some special access to the Fukushima plant, and we, um, you know, that's an, a, a very, um, you know, that goes back to what I was saying about, um, you know, the teachable moment, and it does it does give people an opportunity to uh, understand a little bit about, um, you know, there's some science there. There's a lot of engineering. There's issues related to the cleanup and ultimately leads to a, a hopefully an informed debate about uh, energy policy for not just Japan, but for the United States. And so I think that that, you know, that's energy policy is an important thing, which, you know, is always going to be um, at the forefront. So, I, you know, I, I'm looking at stuff like that. Um, I, you know, I just did a series on e Ebola for the news hour and um, that that story isn't, you know, you know, of course, Ebola is still not officially over, but the idea of um, the trajectory of uh, diseases and zoonotic diseases and the push of humanity into close proximity to some of these uh, virus reservoirs in the, in, in the wild is, uh, I think, a story that, you know, we just saw with the MERS thing that this is going to uh, keep cropping up. Um, I'm, I'm interested in what Pluto's going to look like. I'm very uh, curious about that coming up. I, um, as a matter of fact, I'm, I can hardly wait for that encounter. Boy, that's been a long one. Poor old Pluto lost its planet status along the way, but we still care about Pluto. And uh, yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll be interested to see how the, um, uh, as long as we're in the sp space realm, how uh, NASA continues on its efforts to, um, to, you know, at least come up with some sort of path toward Mars. I, I don't think it's right now uh, properly funded, and I'll, I'll be watching that one closely as well. And of course, I'll be doing lots of stuff on where's the missing airplane, because <laughs> it seems to be, well, CNN cares about it. Just did an interview with CNN on that. They're still, still going after it. We have a question that goes back to what we were talking about before, about how it's important that scientists don't keep the myth of the arrogant scientist. And the question is, what other tips for scientists and engineers do you have to better communicate their research in a way that engages the public while not coming off as arrogant? Yeah, I think, um, you know, a little, uh, little bit of humility is a good thing. And, uh, you know, some of us are better at that than others. And, uh, but it, it does, uh, it does help to be, um, you know, to, to try, you know, it's not like you can go to school to get a sense of humor, but it's, it's, it's not bad to have one. Uh, and if it's self-deprecating at times, all the better. Um, I think that, um, you know, it, it, how, do, how do you tell people to be likable? You know, some people, frankly, some scientists shouldn't, shouldn't come out of the lab, you know, right? I mean, they should, they should be doing their thing and shouldn't even try this because they're not, it's not their thing and that's okay. But the ones that do uh, have the ability uh, and it, it, it's pretty much innate in some ways, although, you know, there, there are ways to teach techniques. Um, I, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, what Alan Alda's uh, up to at Stony Brook on his uh, program for uh, scientists there who um, they actually do um, improv and uh, it basically what, what improv does, I know that sounds crazy, but these are actual, you know, graduate level scientists doing with Alan Alda as their teacher. How cool is that? Uh, doing improv. And, and I, I did a story on this um, 
not too long ago for the news hour. And what that does is it um, it takes uh, it forces introverts to be uh, to put themselves out there a little bit. And uh, a lot of a lot of what is involved in in that kind of dynamic is uh, first of all not being um, so inwardly focused that you you're you're afraid to speak up, but also thinking about a little bit about what what's making the other person tick. So it's a little bit of empathy. So you know it's a little bit of just kind of thinking about where they're coming from, and not being dismissive of that because there are various reasons that people come to those forums with those crazy theories. They, they, maybe they've been watching a lot of Fox News and there, there are a lot of crazy theories or they, they, went, they were Googling around and they find it, we, you can't just um, dismiss that out of hand. Uh, you have to kind of say, well, you know, I understand how you would get that idea. And there is a kernel of truth to that actually, but they've taken a kernel and they've turned it into a molehill and here's ex explains how. And, and it, that's just, you know, it's a little bit of courtesy. It's a little bit of empathy and you know maybe a little bit of humor and um none of those things are easily some of those things can't be taught and and if if scientists are uncomfortable doing it and can't get there maybe they shouldn't try that's okay there maybe there's some other scientists who can do the do that carry that water for them the next question is what's your favorite branch of science to report on Oh, I would never do that in a forum like this. I would never, ever. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I have, um, you know, I, I, I've, gosh, they're, they're, they're all in their own way, you know, fascinating. Um, now, I, I should step, I, I, I shouldn't say that. I, I love them all. Each of them has their own uh, interesting quirks and uh aspects that I that I enjoy so um, I I would I don't want to uh, come down on that and say I, I prefer one to another sure well one branch that you do seem to gravitate towards is the aerospace and the space and I saw yeah, that you're right. on the advisory right. okay. council for I NASA guess, I guess people knew yeah that. and so um I saw in your bi biography about how you were going to be going up in the space shuttle, and that didn't ultimately happen. But are you? Do you have any hopes of going on a private mission sometime? You know, I don't think that's uh, in the cards. Um, I, 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 I've, I've asked uh, Richard Branson several times for a ride on, on his thing. But you know, the truth is, um, I, what I had a, uh, managed to uh, get NASA to agree to when I was at CNN was a, um, a trip to the International Space Station and for up you know a little more than a week and um, that, that was a real opportunity to report on just really what what is microgravity research on the space station look like and you know this is a very expensive laboratory that we built up there and is there really any scientific value to it i think the jury is still out i mean there's value to it when you look at it in kind of the intramural way in, in the in the aspect of of nasa's desire to learn how to spend time in space but does it really have you know scientific value beyond that in other realms and i was very curious about that the idea of going on a kind of a short suborbital hop you know, I, I think that's, frankly, uh, that's uh, bungee jumping for really rich people. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't turn it down if it was offered to me for free, but I don't think the, the, the journalistic value is quite the same. So um, if I could arrange to get to the space station, I'd go. Uh, but I don't think that there's, uh, there's a currently an, uh, a ride available. So uh, I guess, I guess that, that one passed me by. It was close, but you know, unfortunately, the the reasons that it didn't happen are the the horrible loss of Columbia, and uh, so in the context of all that was lost on that day, my my little uh, issue is not that big a deal. Yeah, and what was it like to be reporting on such a big story like that when you when you look back on it now? What do you think about? I think about that uh, moment. You know, it was. Uh, I remember walking into the newsroom that Saturday morning. And saying to the uh, assignment desk, you know, uh, Columbia is coming back. It's an unusual reentry compared to space station missions. 
It's going to be a pre-dawn to dawn arrival across the United States from California through you know, all the way down through Texas and into Florida. Why don't you call up all the affiliates that we have underneath that path? I showed them the path and have them put their cameras out because they're going to see an amazing picture. Well, of course, I had no idea what they would capture ultimately. And of course, the WFAA footage of it breaking up. And um, But I remember uh, there was a moment when I was, I was actually doing dual duty that morning. I was anchoring the morning show. And I was just going to talk the shuttle in like I normally did. And um, so I was kind of you know, had I was in had my mind in two places, and I was listening to the uh, the communication loops uh, with NASA, and uh, I heard them, you know, trying to raise the orbiter, you know, and th there was no response, no response, and you know, there's there are blackouts, but suddenly it was <laughs> the time of landing, and it was overdue, and um, I knew in an instant they were lost. And uh, as anybody who follows that does, because there's no, you know, you don't, there's no holding patterns for, you know, a glider like that. And so I literally, there was a moment where I had to switch positions. We had taken NASA up full and I, I almost heaved, you know, cause I, I knew everybody on that uh, flight and, and I knew, you know, the NASA, NASA is in some sense, you know, a family for me. And I knew everybody involved. I knew how profoundly uh, tragic that was for them. And I just kind of, and I stopped and I, I literally said out loud to myself, you cannot do this. You have to, you just got to do your thing. And I, so I, I kind of just put it aside and I ended up being on the air for 16 hours. And, you know, of course, the other thing is, I'd be lying to you if I didn't tell you, of course, I realized my dream was over too. And, um, but I did my thing. And um, that night I got on a plane to go to Houston, you know, to be for there for the coverage. And I just, I cried the whole way there for uh, the loss of those brave people, for the loss of the orbiter, for what that meant to the space program. And I, I uh, frankly, I cried for my own personal loss of uh, realizing my dream would uh, not happen. So it was, um, I mean, that's a day I'll never forget. And, and you know, there are times when uh, you just have to kind of take that emotional component and put it aside for a little while. And that was one of them. Uh-oh. You still there? Uh, oh, uh, oh. What happened? Hello. Uh, hello, hello, hello. Uh, Huh? Well, they, uh, I just got dropped, so I don't know what's going on. I think it's like died. I think I've done enough. Hello? Anybody there? Hmm. <laughs> <clears throat> Hello? 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 Heather? Uh, hi, Heather. So, uh, for some reason, things dropped off. I don't know yeah, what happened. Sorry, we had an internet connection problem, too. I don't know. It said, mine said that the internet connection was just lost. Oh, okay. Well, I'm back. I don't know if it's, is anybody still there? Yep. We're, we still have viewers and I'm glad that okay. you're back and I'm back. So I lost you right when you were saying that you were thinking about how the Columbia crew was going to be lost. You just knew it. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, um, there was this kind of uh, moment where, um, 
you know, I literally allowed um, and the emotions got the best of me. I'm right there in the middle of processing this. And of course I knew they were gone and you know, I was, couldn't say that on the air just yet. Um, sort of have to lead people through that stuff. And uh, I remember just physically saying out loud, you know, you cannot do this and put the emotional component of my brain off to the side and uh, ended up doing, uh, going on live for 16 hours. And then it was really at the end of the day when I got on the plane to Houston that I, I just, uh, I cried the whole way because I, you know, I, I knew the people, I knew the, the crew members, of course, the NASA, everybody on the ground at NASA and everybody I know at NASA. And, you know, I'd be lying to you if I didn't tell you that I was uh, sad about the fact that my dream was not going to happen as well. So all that was, that was a day I won't uh, forget, that's for sure. Yeah. We have some more questions from the audience. One is, how has Miles adapted to changing to the changing media landscape? Is he a prolific user of social media? Which direction does he think things are going? Well, I'm I would prolific, you know, was relative term. I do tweet, I do uh, a blog, and I do uh, use Facebook and Instagram. I, you know, I, I've used the tools, um, and it's. But I'm still kind of I'm still kind of an old school journalist in some ways. I mean, I still do. There's nothing I enjoy more than just doing a you know a nice, solid, classic, you know, analog television piece. I you know that's kind of my thing. But I'm getting kind of long in tooth, so. Um, so, but yes, I, I think it's absolutely in my business. Uh, if you're not doing that, you're out of business. So, um, and it's, um, I like it because it's, you know, it's a two way street, you know, for years and years, I was talking into, a this unblinking eye and wondering what people were thinking. And, uh, I remember when, um, when I originally got fired from CNN, I was really, um, disappointed that I wouldn't be able to go to the shuttle launches, uh, you know, in my capacity as a reporter. So I ended up um, working out with, um, working out a deal with uh, Spaceflight Now, which is a, a website focused on space matters, uh, to uh, come down to uh, the Cape and, and do a streaming webcast of the launches. And we did the the last six or seven launches that way. And what was really fun about it was, first of all, we would do, you know, six, seven hours on launch day without commercials. It was great. But what was really the best part, uh, you know, it was great to be able to do, you know, that kind of coverage. And we had, you know, we had upwards of, you know, two, 300,000 people watching all over the world. That was great. And, and what was really fun is we had this dialogue. There was like a tw Twitter and a chat box going. And so, a lot of times I'd be saying something like, you know, I forget what launch was it where they scrubbed three times because of weather in Morocco or something like that. And boom, the answer would pop up from one of the uh, people watching. So it really became like this uh, conversation, this two-way street among kind of people who have similar interests and stuff. And so I found that uh, profoundly uh, uh, powerful and, and compared to the idea of just kind of blasting it out and not knowing what people are saying, thinking, doing is, uh, it's, it's much more fun. It's kind of like this. It's kind of like doing this, right? Yeah. And we have one more question from the audience. And that question is, are you optimistic about the future of science communication and reporting? Uh, I am ultimately optimistic. Um, we are in the middle of uh, a tectonic change and uh, there will be winners and losers in this world. Um, and ultimately though, uh, I think that the, um, I think the, the, the subject matter could not be more important uh, in uh, our highly complex uh, world. The world is only getting more complicated and the problems are only becoming more challenging. And it's, uh, it's a real call to, um, uh, arms, if you will, for um, scientists. And so I think um, the the way that the um, media landscape has changed, it's kind of flattened out the distribution, is works to the advantage of scientists if they uh, are willing to get in the game. And uh, you have to get out of the mode of thinking that, you know, a 90 second spot on the CBS Evening News is the gold standard. It's not anymore. 
Uh, it's it's how many Twitter followers you have or how, how many likes you get on Facebook. Uh, and sometimes that's what leads you to the evening news, uh, but that's really where you want to be. And uh, it's important to be playing in that realm and telling your stories that way. Um, the, uh, the business uh, has changed a lot, and there are lots of ways uh, that you can tell your story without having to rely on somebody like me or, um, you know, uh, somebody who has lesser experience. So um, I, think, I think it's kind of exciting, and I just think that you have to see the, the opportunities there, just see where the... Um, the you sort of go for daylight there and not try to try to fight a battle uh, a losing battle trying to get on um, news organizations that have moved into more trivial pursuits um, what I do know is there's a there's an audience out there there are people interested in this subject and if the, the stories are well told the audience will find you they really will it's amazing it's very powerful I don't I can't profess to know what the the secret sauce is what what how some stories do better than others and seem to get more interest but it's I, I would encourage scientists who have uh, any inclination in this regard to get in the game and get out there and start telling your own story as much as you can great well thank you and I want to remind everybody that miles is going to be becoming officially a Sigma Xi honorary member October 22nd through 25th during Sigma Xi's annual meeting and we hope to see all Sigma Xi members there as well as anybody else who's interested in science and engineering you can find more information about that meeting on Sigma Xi's website and that is www.sigmaxi.org miles thank you thank you Heather and thank you all for your good questions Bye. Bye-bye.